From Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. This is Sergeant Bacon. I'm calling for Police Chief Allen. Oh, yes, Sergeant. How are things going? Good and bad, you might say. We're at the hospital. George Enfield just died of his injuries, but it looks like the other man, Charlie Watson, is going to pull through. Has he been questioned yet? No, but the docs say he can be in an hour or so. That's what I'm phoning about. Chief Allen says you can come over if you want to get in on it. Good. I'll see you in about 20 minutes. Oh, uh, Sergeant, did you get the new tally on the robbery? No, I didn't know there was a new one. It stands at 48,000 now. Uh, and murder, too. I guess this one will rip Youngstown to pieces, all right. <laughs> Edmund O'Brien in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Columbia All Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Youngstown Credit Group matter. Expense count item one, forty-five dollars and sixty cents, airfare and incidentals between Hartford and Youngstown, Ohio, where Sergeant Biggin added the following details to what I had already learned. The Youngstown Credit Group is a savings and loan set up for the employees out at Federal Mills. About two years ago, they set up this service to cash the men's paychecks. Enfield and Watson have been going right out to the plant every payday at noon. Charged a small fee for the service. The same two men every week with that kind of money? That's right. And this morning, somebody finally caught up with them. Knew the route they took and the time. Evidently stopped their car some way, got into it, relieved them of the money, and then pushed them out while they were making their getaway. Enfield and Watson are a mess. That's all we've got except an abandoned sedan that might fit in someplace. <laughs> It was a couple of hours later when I was told that one of the victims, George Enfield, had died as a result of being thrown from the speeding car. I went to the hospital and there met Chief Edward J. Allen, a man I'd read about and admired as the police officer who had led the fight that finally forced Detroit's Purple Gang out of Youngstown. I was surprised at his being on hand so early in a case and said so. Because I haven't gotten used to not being a sergeant, I guess. I answer a call with the boys any time I can. Uh, we, we won't be able to press Watson too far. He'll be in pretty bad shape from the sedatives. Uh, yeah. Does he know about his partner being dead? Uh, not yet. And we'd better hold it back. Uh, here. Hello, Watson. You feel like talking about what happened? Sure. I'll try. Thanks. Uh, this is Mr. Dollar. He's an insurance investigator. You had some rough going, Watson. And I'm Chief Allen. Yes, sir. You tell us when you want us to leave, Watson, and we will. But uh, we want to get on this as fast as we can, and the more you can tell us now, the better it'll be. I will. They, they stopped us just after we crossed Spring Common Bridge. Were they waiting, or did they follow you from town? Followed us. They tried to pass us and forced us off the road. You didn't suspect that you were being followed? I didn't think about it. How many men were there? Four. They had white handkerchiefs over their faces. Well, uh, can you give us any kind of a description? I, I couldn't swear to anything. What about clothes? Can you remember if they wore overcoats, hats? Hard to remember. They all seem to look alike now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they wore hats, all of them, and, and overcoats. Were they armed? Yes, sir. All of them were armed. Well, what can you give us on the type of weapons? I don't know very much about guns. Enough to know if they were automatics or cylinder type? The man that took me had an automatic. I remember that. Oh, would you say it was a large gun or a small one? I don't know how to answer it. It didn't look either way. Uh, or was it nickel-plated or blue steel? It was dark, I think. Blue steel. Uh, how tall are you, Watson? Five, nine and a half. Was this man as tall as you? A little taller, sir. Is he heavier? No. Thinner, I'd say. I weigh 170. Yeah, you're doing fine, Watson. Uh, just a few more questions. Did this man say anything to you? Just get out. He held the gun on me and said, get out. At the same time, another one was taking Enfield out. Mm. Enfield was driving? Yes, sir. It was his car. Uh, that was a blue 1948 Plymouth sedan, huh? Yes, sir. They made us get in the back seat on the floor, kneeling with our heads down. Where did you have the money, Watson? In the trunk. Locked in the trunk? Yes, sir. 
in a briefcase. They must have known that. Yeah. Now, how did they operate then, Watson? Well, they made us stay on the floor. They left their car and got an infield, all of them. Then later, maybe 15 minutes, they pushed me out, and that's all I remember. They say anything? Just a word or two to keep us on the floor. Well, Watson, uh, see if you can help us with this. Somebody knew an awful lot about the way you and Enfield operated. Even to the point of knowing they'd have to take the car because you carried the money in the trunk. Who would have known all that? Well, quite a few, sir, but I think I would have recognized them. They wouldn't have to be there, Watson. Somebody who could have given the information to the four men. Well, I can't think of anybody who'd do that, sir. Well, give us the names of as many as you can remember right now. That bunch had to get the information from somebody. The names he listed included those of men in the Youngstown Credit Group, a man or two at Federal Mills, and from the bank where they drew the money each week, three employees who would have known the time they left and that they locked the money in the trunk of the car. There were 12, all told. But instead of our following them up, some officers were assigned to check their movements for anything that might lead us someplace. An alarm on the Plymouth sedan and the description of the man with the glasses was broadcast. And while Chief Allen waited for results at headquarters, I went out to the east side to talk with Enfield's widow. All I can think is he's gone, and I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know. I don't know how to tell the kids that he's gone. Do you have anybody to help you, Mrs. Enfield? Nobody. I don't want anybody. I want to be let alone. Nothing has ever been good. Nothing. I scraped and did without and never got ahead, and now it ends like this. I don't know what I'm going to do. Why do you have to bother me? Because somebody who knew a lot about your husband or Watson is to blame for all this. I don't hardly know what you're saying to me. I just keep thinking I've got to tell the kids. I'm sorry, Mrs. Enfield. I hoped you could help us find the man who did this thing. How could I help anybody? By telling me if there was some acquaintance of your husband's you think might have known his routine when he went to Federal Mills. Somebody who could have taken advantage of what he knew. He wouldn't talk about that. Why should he? Who are some of his friends, Mrs. Enfield? I didn't know many of his friends. He never told me much about what he did. Never brought them here. Where would he have met them, then? Downtown, someplace. I'm not sure. It could be important. He used to bowl, but I never went with him. I couldn't say where. Why do you make me talk about things he did? He won't do them no more. Not right you're bothering me like this. Not now. Not so soon like this. Leave me alone. All right, Mrs. Enfield. Believe me, I wouldn't have come if it weren't so important to learn as much as we can as quickly as we can. The importance of speed, of course, was based upon the fact that the $48,000 to have been used to cash paychecks was in small, untraceable denominations. What we were afraid of was that the 400 men would split the money, separate as quickly as possible, and leave the area. It was 5.30 p.m. by the time I reported back to Chief Allen. The search for the Plymouth by then was statewide, but nothing had developed. The quarter past seven, something did. The owner of a farm a few miles from town called in a tip. A few minutes later, we pulled up in front of his house. I didn't think anything Seven. about it till I got to the paper Seven this evening. I read how the police were looking for a Plymouth sedan. Said my wife, station. wonder if that could be the one. She said, don't seem likely, but I made up my mind to call you anyway. Well, I'm glad you did, Mr. Long. Well, there's a Plymouth like that down there at the edge of my land. It's there now? Well, it was at nightfall. And what's more, eight, I was fixing five, some roof fence down that way when it drove in. Eight, I remember now there was four men got out of it. Now, what time was that? Seven, well, about noon. Did you get a good look at these men? I didn't pay much attention till another car come and uh, turned around. Then they all got into that one and drove off. Were they carrying anything? A briefcase? No, I didn't notice. Now, which way did they go? Well, toward the city, same way both cars come from. Now, what kind of a car was it? Well, these blame new models all look the same to me. I couldn't say. It was blue, though. What about the men? Is there a chance you'd recognize any of them? Well, I couldn't be sure. I don't pay much attention to people. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Long. We'll go take a look at that, Plymouth. Just drive down the end of my fence there. You'll see a turnoff. It's not a real road, sort of a lover's lane like. That's 
the car all right, Donna. Yeah, they dumped it in a hurry, didn't they? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Key still in the trunk lock. We're up against a really well-planned thing here, aren't we? They're sure ahead of us so far. Another car, a fifth man to figure now. You think they went back to town? Would you have planned it that way? Maybe. If I had, I would have thrown you a curve. You and all the deputies and the state police would be looking for a group of four making a getaway. Yeah, that's right. But I'd be back in town, not part of a group anymore, but anybody on the street. Yeah. With a drawer full of unmarked bills someplace. Well, we'll get the sedan in and see if it'll give us anything. I can drive it if you want without messing up too many prints. Yeah, that would save some time. Hey, come here. What have you got? Look at the stain on the floor there. Could that be blood? It's hard to tell with just a flash. Let's get this thing in and put somebody to work on it. We learned that night that the stain on the rear floor of the sedan was blood. But I didn't get its full meaning until the next morning when I showed up at police headquarters. Hi, Sergeant. Chief in? He's been here since dawn. Go on in. Thanks. Ah, there you are. Just called your hotel. I take it I'm late for something. Did you sew this thing up after I got out of your way? Oh, hardly. I asked him to speed up the autopsy on Enfield last night, and it turns out that he was beaten before he was thrown out of that car. Oh? Well, with all the rest of the damage to his head, it was easy to miss. But the fatal wounds were caused by a blunt instrument, probably a length of pipe. And he must have known somebody in the group. Sure he did. We've got a downright premeditated murder on our hands. We will return you to yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. One of the most informative and forceful campaigns for freedom is being scheduled by the Voice of America during the last week of December. Special dramatic programs, news roundups, and musical programs will be beamed around the world by this great organization. You are urgently requested to write to your friends overseas and tell them not to miss the Voice of America's special year-end overseas program. Now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we bring you the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Morning, Watson. Good morning, sir. How's it going today, Watson? Better? Yeah, I think so. You caught those guys yet? Not yet. Have you been told that George Enfield is dead? No. He died? They killed him, Watson. They beat him before they pushed him out of the car. The reason must have been because he knew one of the men, or maybe more than one. Now, I know at a time like that, things get a little out of focus. The most level-headed man in the world isn't likely to think quite straight. But we want to go over what happened with you again. Sure, but I, I, I don't see how it could have been anything like that. It almost has to be, Watson. They didn't kill you, so why would they kill him if they didn't have a darn good reason to? I don't know. Uh, tell me, uh, what did Enfield say while this stick-up was going on? I don't think he said anything. I didn't hear anything he said anyway. Not any names, if that's what you mean. Well, that's what I want you to be as clear about as you can. Oh, I'm sure I didn't hear anything. I... I was talking so myself, maybe he could have said something I didn't hear. While you were still in the front seat? Yes, sir. I was scared stiff, and I kept telling this guy not to shoot me. That's all I was thinking of. I was scared stiff, and I couldn't help it. All I remember is him sitting with his hand still on the wheel and those men with masks on coming for us. When you were both on the floor of the back seat, Watson, did he say anything then? No, sir. What about you? I was begging for my life, and I'm not ashamed to say so. You don't have to be. I was saying I don't care about the money and to let me out of there. I thought they were going to kill us then. Because I couldn't think of any other reason why they should take us with them. And Enfield said nothing. No, I, I'm, I'm sure he didn't. Uh -huh. I remember now one of the men even said something. He said, what's the matter with you? Why aren't you begging like your buddy? And George still didn't say anything. Now, did this man call him by name? I don't think so. No, he didn't. Mm. Go. Yeah, I think we've stayed long enough. Thanks very much, Watson. Sure. You may have helped us quite a lot. You get some rest now. We'll see you later. Yes, sir. What do you think? 
Well, I guess the same thing occurred to you. That Enfield might have set the whole thing up and they got rid of him because he was the only link between them and the job. Uh-huh. Well, I'll give Watson a half hour's rest and see if I can find out how Enfield was acting before they were stopped. Will you go out and check the widow again? Sure. <laughs> What do you want? Well, we've learned some new things about your husband's death, and I wanted to tell you about them. What kind of things? May I come in for a minute? For a minute? I've got work to do. Thanks, Mrs. Enfield. What kind of things did you find out about George? That he didn't die because he was pushed out of the car. How was he, then? He died as a result of a beating. The man who stole the money killed him for one reason or another. I don't see any difference. He's gone, and it don't change things how it happened. Is that all you came to tell me? Ms. Enfield, I don't understand you. Don't you want to help us find the men who killed him? It's over with. Now I'm going to try and forget. No, I'm afraid it's not as simple as that. I can tell you this, Mrs. Enfield. The police think it's possible that your husband was involved in that robbery. Why do they? I told you yesterday, those men knew so much about the habits of your husband and Watson... That they must have learned from one of them or from somebody very close to either one. And Watson is pretty much cleared in their books. I don't know. You don't know what? I'm all mixed up. I knew something was wrong. I even thought about what you just said. But I tried not to. I didn't want it to be true. If it's true, it'll come out. You've got to realize that, Mrs. Enfield. My sister from Cleveland came and got the kids. She can keep the truth from them until I can move out of here. They think he was a hero. They're all I care about. Nothing can hurt me any more than he did. I'm sorry, Mrs. Enfield. I'll show you what kind of a man he was. This is what I found yesterday before you came. A railroad ticket. He was going to leave us. California. Why didn't you tell me yesterday? I didn't want anybody to know I was ashamed. The kids, mostly. I didn't want them ever to find out. He was going to leave us with no money. With bills we couldn't pay. And that's all. That's what he thought of us. Was he involved in the robbery, Mrs. Enfield? I don't know. Something was going on. For the past two weeks, he'd tell there was something. He was out every night. He'd say it was at the High Point bowling alleys, but one night I was sick and I phoned there. He hadn't been there for three nights. Do you have any idea who he'd been seeing? No, but one night he talked on the phone to somebody named Carl. I was listening, and he said he'd meet this Carl at the high point. That's all I know. Nothing more definite about the robbery? No. Except why would he buy a railroad ticket to California unless he was going to run away? Carl at the high point. Thanks, Mrs. Enfield. We'll see if we can find him. Comparing notes with Chief Allen made it look all the more like we were on the right track. Watson had told him that Enfield's attitude when they left the bank could have meant that he was under some kind of strain. Surprisingly, the name Carl fit in almost immediately. Carl Huffman, a punk with an unimportant police record, had been seen meeting Enfield in the High Point alleys. He was easily located and brought in for questioning. You remember me, Huffman. What are you doing still in town? No law says I can't be here. Who told you to say that? Nobody has to tell me to say something that's true. Remember the last time you were in here? No. Well, I do. You were playing it big then, too. You were counting on some friends from Detroit who didn't come through. Whose gang was that, Huffman? I don't remember. Yes, you do. You thought it was the strongest organization in this part of the country. You thought hiding behind them, you couldn't be picked up. You had the idea that just because you were on the fringe of organized crime, nobody could hurt you. But you got hurt, didn't you? A year on the last rap. So I got a year. It settles it. If you had any brains, Huffman, you wouldn't be where you are now. You'd be a decent citizen. But here you are. You just can't get along in the world like everybody else. All right, let's talk about George Enfield. What about him? Do you want to take the rap for his murder? I can give it to you. What are you handing me? What murder? All we need is the fact that he was with you night before last. We've got that. It's a lie. I'll believe our witness under oath before I believe you. It's a lie. What witness? Ben Hocheck, the high point. 
He says you were there the other night. Oh, sure I was. There's no law against that either. Hochek says you've been meeting Enfield there and leaving with him. He says you've been doing that for a couple of weeks. Well, I don't mean anything. You ought to play it smart, Huffman. He's got a lot on you. Ah, oh, Kenny, I didn't do nothing. You were seeing Enfield. Even his wife knew that. She knew he was planning to leave town, too. I can't help that. You were seeing him so you could set up that robbery, isn't that right? I don't know what you're talking about. Let's get back to that other thing you don't know about. Where were you the other morning between 11 and noon? I've already told you. I slept late. Your hotel clerk says he saw you leave at about 10.30. Well, he must have been mistaken. Do you want to take this rap alone? What rap? You've got nothing on me. We've got enough to make a charge stick. You, you can't have it. I didn't do nothing. I'll show you what we've got. You're in a bad way, Huffman. He didn't tell you yet about the witness. How can there be a witness? A farmer out where you dumped the Plymouth. He saw you drive it in. He watched you open the trunk and take the briefcase out. He's on his way in now. All right. Did you ever see this before, Huffman? No, no. I, I don't even know what it is. Don't know what it is. What does it look like? It's a piece of pipe we found in a ditch along the highway out past Federal Mills. About a half mile beyond where you tossed Enfield out of the car. I tell you, I don't know what you're talking about. Look at it close, Huffman. You see these marks up here? They're small, but they're bloodstains. Don't mean anything to me. It did to Enfield. That's what killed him. I, I don't know anything about it. I never saw it before. And how come it's got your prints on it? That's a lie. I never touched it. I wasn't even... Oh, what's he wants? That's right. Why take it all yourself? Look, look. I, I didn't know there was going to be any killing. If I had, I, I wouldn't have got mixed up in it. Who were the rest of them? Bill Lewick and Vern Clark. But it was Enfield's idea. He started it. There are two more men, aren't there? Oh, what kind of a break do I get for giving you? You can't make a deal with me, Hoffman. You know that. Any break will have to come from the district attorney. Who are the other two men? The Thayer brothers. The Thayer brothers? Yeah. When did they come back to town? A couple of weeks ago. They've been laying mighty low. We haven't heard about it. Well, they wanted to keep quiet. They came back to build up a new organization. Chief, look, I, I, I'm giving you a lot. I ought to get a break. Well, it won't hurt you to cooperate. Well, they're the ones that did the killing, Ed and Charlie. Why? They didn't like Enfield. They were sitting in the back seat with him. They didn't say anything till after, though. Then they said that they were afraid he'd spill everything. They knew he was going to leave town. And they said nobody would ever find out how he was killed. Hmm. Well, the other two men still teamed up with him? No, no. This was the first job for Lewick and Clark. They work at the Ace Trucking Company. Now, what about the Thayer brothers? Where are they? They're staying at their old place out at the city limit. The Tuxedo Club? Yeah. Huh? Well, that's still closed up. Well, that's where they are, unless they left when they learned you picked me up. Well, how would they know that? Look, I'm giving you an awful lot of stuff, Chief. They know because one of their friends has been following me around ever since the job. Sergeant Biggins. Yes, sir? The Thayer brothers are back in town. Back? Huh? According to Hoffman, they've holed up in their old joint. Get two or three squad cars out there. I don't want them to try to take the place because the Thayers have probably been tipped. I want some roadblocks set up in case they try to leave. I'll get right on it. And get five or six of our best men to meet me here at 4.30. We'll go out and pick them up at dusk. I got the background on the Thayer brothers while Chief Allen and I were on our way to pick up the other two men named by Huffman. They'd been at the bottom of most of the organized crime in Youngstown when Allen had taken over. The fight against them had become almost a personal one. It ended when the Thayers left town, and the fear now is that it would be reopened. There was no trouble from William Lewick and Vernon Clark, a couple of first-timers, out for some easy money. Their statements bore out Carl Huffman's that the Thayer brothers had done the killing. At 4.30, the process of bringing them in got underway. According to Fredericks, they tried to leave a little after three. <coughs> they pulled out in a gray sedan, but when they saw the roadblock, they turned back. So that's what we face. They know we're coming, and they're waiting for us. You men were picked because you've all been up against them before. You know what to expect. Anybody have a question? All right, we better get started. Anything happening, Biggins? Some guy from a grocery store back near that crossroad got curious and came to talk to us. He says the Thayers have been coming in his store. 
He says they've been drunk for the last couple of days. That's something to think about, Chief. Yeah, I know it is. If they're gassed up, they're a cinch to make a play. Well, we'll see. Well, who's that up ahead? Well, that's Samuels. He got here just a minute ago. Walter and Hayes are with him, both with Thompson's. Good. Hey, no lights in the place. I don't know what they're thinking. They must know we're coming. What's the layout of the place? Well, the living quarters are in the rear. That's where they'll probably be, but... Uh, uh, Biggins. Yes, sir. You take one of the men with the Thompson go in the front. I want the other to cover me at the rear door. Walter's back there already. Uh, good. Well, let's get it done, then. Dollar? It's my case, too, Chief. Okay. Good luck, Biggins. Yes, sir. I'm moving in now, Walter. Right. That's the door, Dollar. Good. There aren't any windows. No. You can cover me from here. I'll be a hero in front of that door. <laughs> I'll watch it. Ed! Charlie! Police! Keep out of He's all right. All right, Walter. The Thompson, if they want it that way. <laughs> account item two, $104 miscellaneous. Item three, same as item one, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $195.20. Remarks? A reasonable figure, I think, considering not only the recovery of most of the stolen money, but also the fact that the company received the personal services of my good friend, Chief of Police Edward J. Allen. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music by Wilbur Hatch. Edmund O'Brien can now be seen starring in the Paramount Pictures Technicolor production, Silver City. Featured in tonight's cast were Ed Begley, Bill Johnstone, Polly Bear, Virginia Gregg, Tim Graham, and Stacey Harris. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> This is Dick Cutting inviting you to join us next week at this time when Edmund O'Brien returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. When you read the headlines on Korea, remember this. Industry can produce the bombers, the munitions, but only you can give the blood. And it's your blood that is saving the lives of 97 out of every 100 wounded men. Don't wait till it's too late. Give now. Call your local Red Cross blood center for an appointment. And then keep that date to save a life. A comical catastrophe is about to overtake a department store when Mortimer Snurd takes a pre-Christmas job behind the counter. The full details, plus a visit by musical comedy star Lisa Kirk, will be heard tomorrow night on the Edgar Bergen, Charlie McCarthy Show. Stay tuned now for the Von Monroe Show, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. And remember, King Arthur Godfrey's Roundtable holds court every Sunday afternoon on the CBS Radio Network.